everybody, in this video, we're looking at the high performing yet affordable full suspension Polygon Siskiyou T7. Now it's a pretty incredible trail bike for the price, but there are a bunch of things that we should talk about, so let's get right into it. Now, of course, I have to mention up front that this bike was sent to the channel for a review, but this is not a paid sponsorship and all opinions of the bike are my own. Now, I've been riding this bike around for a couple of months now, and so I have a decent sense for its capabilities, its quirks, and its limitations. So the Siskiyou T7 is Polygon's sort of do-it-all mid-travel trail bike. For 29-inch wheeled models, it's got 140 millimeters of travel up front and 135 millimeters in the rear, and for 27 five inch wheels, it has 150 millimeters of travel up front and 140 millimeters in the rear, which for a lot of riders is gonna be in that Goldilocks zone where it'll handle a substantial amount of chunky downhill abuse, but still remains rather pleasant while climbing. Now, just like on the Siskiyou D series, the wheel size that you get depends on the frame size with small frames getting a 27 five inch wheel, large and extra large frames getting a 29 inch wheel and you actually have a choice between 27 5 and 29 inch wheels for medium size frames now this t7 back here is a medium 29er which is the wheel size that i tend to favor for my riding style now on my scale it comes in at a somewhat hefty 36.9 pounds or 16.7 kilograms and it's essentially stock with the exception of the pedals which are my go-to race face chesters now the frame design is full suspension of course and is constructed from budded 6061 aluminum alloy which offers strength while reducing weight. Now regarding the geometry, the frame set is right in line with the trend of modern trail bikes and offers a slack head tube angle of 65 and a half degrees and stack and reach numbers of 607 and 460 millimeters respectively. Short 430 millimeter chainstays keep it playful and poppy for a 29er and a relatively low bottom bracket height of 335 millimeters corresponding to a BB drop of 39 millimeters keeps you feeling like you're riding in the bike rather than on top of the bike. Now as with most modern mountain bikes you do get a tapered head tube for additional stiffness and the frame and fork employ boost spacing with through axles for additional stiffness and strength. Now I did confirm with Polygon that the 2021 model and the new 2022 model that I have here are essentially the same bike. Now specifically the frame is identical on both models with perhaps only minor differences in the component spec. So while this review does pertain to the 2022 model that I have here, it basically should apply to the outgoing 2021 model as well. Now the only paint finish available is this light blue and bright green combo, which I personally find really good looking, especially with the prominent Polygon logo on the underside of the down tube. Now, if you ask me, it's actually very similar to one of the popular Trek colorways, which is more of an observation and neither here nor there. And then of course, adding to the aesthetic appeal are the internally routed cables running through the down tube for a nice clean look. Now, as far as components go, starting with the suspension, you get the solid RockShox Recon RL fork up front paired with the RockShox Deluxe Select Plus rear shock both of which are air sprung and offer a decent amount of tunability for the weekend warrior. Now you won't get any high and low speed compression or rebound adjustments, but you do get basic compression all the way up to lockout and rebound on the fork and rebound in a two position compression on the rear shock. The brakes are the Tektro HD M735 hydraulic disc brakes with four piston front calipers and two piston rears and 180 millimeter rotors front and back for some surprisingly good stopping power. For wheels and tires, you do get a pretty decent setup consisting of genuine Shimano hubs laced to house brand entity alloy rims and wrapped in the popular name brand Schwalbe Hans Damp tubeless tires in 2.6 inch width. Now, rather than go with an off the shelf wheel, I'm guessing they went with the Shimano hub because this drivetrain is 12 speed and it requires Shimano's relatively new micro spline free hub body. Now, speaking of the drivetrain, you do get the new Shimano Dior 12 speed group set with a 32 tooth chain ring and a 10 to 51 cassette in the back for some really massive range. Now I'll mention this a little bit later in the video, but this group set is really freaking awesome for the money. And it's hard to believe just how far wide ranging 12 speed group sets have come in such a short period of time. Now, one very pleasant surprise is that in its stock form, it does include an internally routed dropper seat post, which for a bike at this price point is really nice. For small and medium frames, you get a Trans X 150 millimeter dropper. And for large and extra large frames, you get 170 millimeters of dropper travel. And then the finishing kit consisting of the saddle stem and handlebars are from Entity and are relatively basic. Now, the handlebars have a bit of rise to them and they're 780 millimeters in width, which should suit most riders. Now, most bikes these days will come with a generic set of plastic test ride pedals, not meant for any heavy abuse, but the Siskiyou actually comes with a semi-decent 
different set of alloy pedals, which I actually rode for a few rides until I got a set of my go-to race face pedals. And I have to say that these stock pedals aren't half bad. Totally rideable in the short term until you decide which pedals you ultimately prefer. Now on paper, it's tough to believe that in mid 2022, a full suspension trail bike at this spec costs less than $2,000 US for the complete bike. That's really just pretty incredible value. If you browse around even for a couple of minutes, you'd realize that to get anything remotely similar from one of the big brands, you'd undoubtedly be spending up to an additional thousand dollars or more in some cases. Which of course is one of the reasons direct to consumer brands like Polygon are so appealing. Now of course what actually matters, how does the thing actually perform when putting it to the test? So I've ridden this bike on several SoCal MTB trails over the past couple of months on everything from mellow fire roads to some fast and flowy single track to even some pretty steep and chunky stuff as well. And while I do consider myself a pretty average cyclist, I do feel like I pushed this bike pretty hard and I've been really impressed with the performance so far. Now, I never felt overwhelmed or out of control on the steep and chunky stuff and I was pleasantly surprised at how progressive the rear suspension felt. Now, when looking at the old funnel meter on the rear shock, I never seemed to exceed the stroke with the sag set up properly. And while I don't do huge drops or jumps, I never really bottomed out too hard, or if I did, it never really felt too harsh. Now, I don't claim to be an expert in suspension design, but I did feel that the small bump compliance was really good. It seemed to track really well over unpredictable terrain, and that may or may not have something to do with the claimed benefits from their own faux bar suspension linkage design. Now, all of this to say, I was really impressed with the descending capabilities of the bike in almost all scenarios. Now, on climbs, the bike's weight, I think, might have played a role in making it feel just a tad bit sluggish. The black head tube angle, which certainly contributes to downhill stability, generally makes climbing a bit more challenging since keeping it pointed in a straight line requires just a little bit of extra work due to that excessive wheel flop. Now, this isn't a criticism of this bike in particular, it's just one of the drawbacks of having a slack head tube angle in general. Still, I always found that I could settle into a climb and spin it out and eventually get to the top. Now, I will say that the pedaling platform did feel pretty stable, and even when I forgot to lock out the rear shock, I didn't experience too much bob in the rear end, perhaps a result of the claimed 10% increase in anti-squat in the frame's kinematics. I would also add that with a few relatively minor upgrades, you could pretty easily drop a couple pounds off the bike's weight, which would certainly help when going uphill. I think also what made the climbs more bearable was the massive 51 tooth large cog on the Dior 12 speed drivetrain. Now paired with the 32 tooth chain ring, you've got a really low, low gear that should help you get up and over just about anything without going too anaerobic for too long. And since we're back on the drivetrain, I have to say that this Shimano Dior 12 speed is really good. The shift action is so light and crispy and the shifts are quick and precise. Furthermore, setup, which can sometimes be finicky with these 12 speed systems, was actually a breeze on the Shimano 12 speed. And even though I run GX Eagle on my personal Santa Cruz, which is pretty good, I have to admit that maybe I'm a convert. This Shimano drivetrain is truly a standout offering, and I think anyone who tries it will immediately understand what I mean. Okay, so typically this is where I'd state all the things that I wasn't a huge fan of, but if I'm being totally honest, it's really hard to point out any glaring downsides on the new Siskiyou T7. It descends really well and really feels like it has more travel than it actually does. Climbs aren't super fun on this bike, but you know, when are they really? They're bearable and due to the super low gearing, you can still spin up most grades if you're disciplined and you can settle into a rhythm. Now I'd say the only downside is perhaps that the bike is rather weighty in stock form, but I think that weight isn't necessarily as big a deal as some make it out to be. Plus, like I said, you can always drop weight by upgrading components down the line, so it's really not a deal breaker for me. So who is this bike for? Well, I would say that this is not an entry level bike by any means. I might also add that it's probably not your first or even second mountain bike. Now this bike, in my opinion, straddles the entry to mid range categories and offers a rider with a solid platform from which they can make subsequent upgrades and really take it to the next level. The new Siskiyou T7 is for the serious mountain biker who wants a top performing bike, but who isn't yet ready to shell out the money for a top shelf boutique brand. Now I often talk about the point of diminishing return when it comes to bikes and bike components, and there always seems to be sort of this inflection point on the spectrum of products where after a certain point, spending more money just doesn't get you as much in terms of quality and performance. Now, just like with the Siskiyou D7 that I reviewed last year, I strongly believe that this T7 sits right at that inflection point where you're really maximizing the value per dollar spent and you're not paying for anything frivolous like exotic materials or a boutique brand name. All right, so that's gonna wrap it up for this one. Again, I think this is an awesome bike for someone who's seriously getting into mountain biking 
and wants a solid foundation upon which to build. It completely rips right out of the box and with all the money you save by not buying a mainstream brand, you can upgrade parts as you see fit to lighten the bike or to tweak it to your preferences. Now for me, the first things that I would probably do are to upgrade the pedals and maybe convert to tubeless tires, but that's really simple since both the rims and the tires are tubeless ready. You just need to get some tubeless sealant, some rim tape, and a pair of tubeless valves to do the conversion. Okay, so that's gonna do it for this one. Thanks again for watching and thanks for subscribing if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time.